Um, welcome to all, to all of you. I'm so glad uh, you took time to come here to learn about uh, the cuisine of the Turks. Um, it's a wondrous cuisine, it's a vast cuisine. Uh, there's so much to talk about, there's so much to say, and it would be a crime to finish everything, and you could possibly do it in the one hour uh, we have limited ourselves with. First, uh, let me introduce myself to those who don't know me. Uh, I'm Engin Akın. I've been writing for newspapers and magazines for the last 20 years <coughs> about food only. And I have written uh, three books and another book is hopefully coming out in the States uh, again about Turkish cuisine. And so we can start. Today we're going to have an overall look to the Turkish cuisine, but I thought uh, for those of you, I just assumed you're living in Turkey and would like to know more about what you're eating, about what you see on the streets, and, and have a deeper sense of the cuisine of the Turks. Because just eating uh, doesn't really satisfy, it can satisfy your tummies, but it does not satisfy your intellect. It can be a very simple dish, and you may think, oh, what is this? Is this, you know, it's probably not, you might not like it. But if you know the story behind it, uh, how many people have done that for certain reasons, uh, what, it is, what it means in the history, the culture of the people, it will mean more to you, and you will be happy that you've had that, you know, you've had a chance to eat it. So, I'll try to get as specific as possible uh, about things that you probably will have no chance to learn from other spots, from other places. Um, let's start uh, from where the Turks started their big journey. They have lived near the Lake of Usuk, the first Turks tribe, Turkish tribes, Baltash, Balkash, and Aral. Uh, Sirideria and Amuderia. These are two important rivers that the nomadic groups, mostly by the Sirideria, lived there and started uh, their gastronomy. It was a nomadic gastronomy. Uh, and there will be another map later on, so we start here, but then of course the journey goes on and on and on. But this is the heart of our gastronomy. This is the way um, I want to believe and this is the way that I can almost very well prove it to you that whatever we had there we still have and uh, we have built a great cuisine and that very little we have done. Um, people say uh, that the Turks um, were just nomadic and uh, they were herding animals, which they were, of course. <coughs> but we have to know that they were also involved in agriculture. And as nomadic as they were, they still um, had time to plant uh, wheat and make use of it. And most of the uh, products you will see, which have come to, the, uh, to this age, to this period, uh, is wheat products. Uh, so as nomadic as they were, they went fishing by the lakes, uh, also by the rivers, so they were very much used to the river fish, the, uh, the lake fishes, uh, they have not seen yet a uh, uh, sea fish, but eventually they will. And um, so, and this is also uh, the valley, val valley between two uh, mountain, uh, mountains that uh, they lived which was very prosperous and had a good soil to, to raise things. That we will see later on. Um, as I said, Turkish people have a great history, a big history, a long history, and uh, the Turkish cuisine uh, is said to be one of the three great cuisines of the world. And this is um, by right 
by right it is so, because they have been mingled with lots of uh, other uh, cultures, they have traveled a lot, they have seen all kinds of climates, they have uh, met all kinds of people from uh, different cultures, so they had a time to, to have experience in many things, and of course gastronomy being very essential and very uh, much of the people, um, they had a chance uh, to absorb and take it with them. As I told you, uh, the ancient the tribal Turks were, you know, uh, were um, they had summer homes, and uh, summer homes were, of course, were tents, and uh, winter homes probably weren't tents. That I really can't say. Uh, and they lived in the cities also. So you cannot say Turks are purely nomadic. And um, so at one period, the, the Turkish tribes had spread out so big in the area, um, let me go back, uh, that they, are, they have the, like the Karahanlılar, Gazneliler, İlhan, İlhanis, they, there were lots of Turkish um, nations and they were all around this area. So uh, they, it was, it became a very deeply rooted um, uh, culture. The Turkish culture became a very deeply co uh, rooted culture in Central Asia. So much that uh, people wanted to understand the Arabs coming for the conquering lands for the Islam and uh, mostly Arabs trying to conquer. Of course, there were the Chinese in the south, uh, always in uh, war and very rarely in peace with the Turks. Uh, but the Turkish language and Turkish culture, it had to be explained to the people so that they could live <laughs> knowing what's going on. And we have Mahmoud al-Kashgari, um, he was uh, commissioned to write a Turkish uh, dictionary for the Arabs. The period when Arab, um, Arabs had been living uh, with these people, with Turkish and Persian people there in the Central Asia. Of course, it's a huge dictionary with all kinds of terms and it's a dictionary, but um, if you go through it, you will see that you can uh, see a lot of um, food names, and those people who say, well, you know, Turks are nomadic, they don't know how to do, what to do, anything, you know, sometimes. <laughs> if they read this, they'll understand. There's a lot to, uh, there was a lot going on in the sense of gastronomy at that period even, that's 11th century. And in uh, like 8th, 9th century, the Arabs were there to, to spread the Islam religion. So this is one picture from uh, the nomads uh, of Turkey very recently, the Sarıkeçiller, uh, a big nomadic group. There is Karakeçiller and Sarıkeçiller. Um, this was made into um, a documentary by a friend of mine uh, because um, they were being moved to a city and to become urbanized. But I don't know how they would become urbanized because they really, uh, have been living like this for centuries. There were tribes still living in Turkey and there are still tribes living in Turkey. The life of the, uh, the nomadic uh, ways, especially herding uh, goats and mostly goats and sheep. And of course, uh, living in tents, uh, the men uh, went to herd their, graze their sheep uh, or the animals, mostly small animals, not big cows, as they don't like to be uh, moved around. Um, the women usually had to prepare something filling, something um, also delicate in the sense they could do uh, at their best. And this is the start of our uh, greatest dishes. This is the start of our baklava. This is the start of our bereks. Uh, and there are so many varieties of it that uh, we have to be grateful to these ladies, to their ancestors who were doing this for years and on. It's uh, uh, at least more than 2,000 years of expertise, patience, and tender and love. 
So uh, what uh, could they have been eating in Central Asia? I found there are a lot more, but not to bore you, I got few names here for you. And so Badhaj is, is the vine, so they had wine, the uh, Central Asian Turks. Balıksa, balık is a Turkish word meaning fish. To wish to eat fish, balıksa, they wanted to, so I mean they knew about fish. Bulat, this is very interesting, to cook in the steam. Sorry, <laughs> we got a little fouled up last night with my uh, assistant and my daughter-in-law. She speaks French only, so you have to excuse us for some misspellings. Uh, to cook in the steam of the pot. This is a very delicate cooking, and remember, this is the way we want to cook our food, actually, in this period, uh, because it keeps all the vitamins, and uh, it um, really doesn't change uh, the taste. So, bulat, so they, the Turks were cooking their food, whatever they had, in the, uh, in the uh, steam, not stewing, this was working, uh, cooking this. Buldu, um, a kind of sweet, which has fresh or uh, fry, uh, dried, not dried, dried grapes. So they had lots of grapes, we should understand, and they were using in a kind of sweet dish, which I have no idea it was like. Büskeç. Now, this is a very uh, good word for me, because büskeç means çörek. Çörek is the, uh, the evolved bread, the, the developed bread because uh, bread has only flour, water, and maybe some salt, but çörek can have uh, some sugar, some butter, some fillings, and uh, they are building on that first very simple bread. They're making a, a, a more a richer uh, dish, a more creative dish, so uh, it shows creativity and uh, richness. Uh, Bushinche, bunch of grapes. Butunge, eggplant. You know how much uh, eggplants, uh, eggplant dishes we have in Turkey. I'm sure if you've been here for some time, you must have realized that. And uh, yes, uh, eggplant was um, at that time was even there. And but of course, if we had maybe one or two dish now. As one Armenian um, jewelry man said, in the, who was uh, uh, selling jewelry to Sultan Abdul Hamid II, we have 3,000. That's, that's exaggeration, but it shows how many we have. Chabak, a small fish in the Turkish lake, the Isik Lake. Chadır, Chadır is starch. Uh, Nishadır, the name hasn't changed that much. Chicken. Uh, I think you should remember this word chicken. Chicken is what we call somebody who's ugly in, in the Aegean dialect. Chirkin is the word in uh, the Istanbul language or the, the proper language. Chicken is a uh, language of the region. So a weed in wine which wasn't liked and was called a chicken. A chirp, wine residue. So they had wine, yes, they, they, they made wine. They made wine from honey, they made uh, wine from grapes, and they had lots of lots of carrots, and I think they still have a lots of lots of carrots in Central Asia, even though we don't use it that much anymore. Uh, uh, I mean, it's part of our gastronomy. Kakuk, kakuk, dried veggies and grains and fruits. That's one thing which has come all the way from the back, uh, from the, that time of history to our time, even though some vegetables uh, don't have to be dried, we're still drying them. It's a, uh, because we're used to it. Uh, taste is very conservative. You, you want to have the things you've always had. That's why we're still, and I'm glad we're doing that because it's another section of our cuisine. Can you eat a large spread of food to be looted? Um, this is important because the sultans, um, when they had the empire, they had spread food on, um, on the ground for the Yeniseris uh, to be looted. Uh, that might not be the good word, but it's exactly being looted. They all ran and 
and the, the, it was a fun time. And it was something that they kept, it's supposedly because the word is there. Offering of drinks to visitors who come unannounced in the evening, just like the, let's say, the, uh, the Europeans or Americans do. Would you like to have a drink? That was what they did also at that time. Kes, this is also an interesting uh, word. Burned milk and flour mixture in the bottom of the pan. You, you probably have heard of the bottom burnt uh, pudding, uh, kazandibi. So I just like to think that it goes back to that time. Why not? Because it does taste good when it burns. Kazar to fry, so they were frying. Now, just to remind you, it's this 11th century. I think um, this was, uh, I'm doing all this in a way to defend um, our cuisine, our gastronomy of saying, you know, it's just nomadic, nothing. No, there was a lot of that the people were doing at that period, at that period. Of course, yogurt, corn, and kurple kebab. You know, you know, we're a kebab land, and they were doing kebabs even at that time. So this is one deli delicacy, I will call it, as nomadic, as primitive as it is, it's still a very delicious food. And nowadays they're uh, serving that all on the streets, uh, and people really love to eat that. It's a thin uh, yufka, uh, the thin pastry, which we call yufka, and um, uh, just with a lot of different fillings, but mostly cheese. And here, this lady uh, is in my... Um, hometown is doing this as they have been doing. And um, again back to the uh, Mahmoud al-Kashgar, Manila, uh, to slaughter a sheep to eat the brain. We love brain. As um, uh, it's irritating as it might sound, it really tastes good. I really wish you, you could taste if you haven't had it. Especially my father used to like it, and he used to bring some <laughs> grain. Or we bought, he brought us head, and the brain was taken, and we ate it. I'm sorry to say, it's like you you like what you've been used to. And to eat brain or to serve brain was really important. And it was a sheep would be slaughtered just to offer the brain. This was for Hans, for you know, so Hans of that period. It was a big offering, a very important offering. Ot means spices, so they did have a lot of spices, but I'm not going to... <laughs> it's funny enough, salus, sakus is what we say now. Salus is what they said at that period, 11th century, is mustic. Um, I don't know if you've been, uh, if you've come across mustic, any of you. Uh, they've been using it lately. At, that, at one period, they stopped using it, but now they're coming back because they want to pick up their um, spices and uh, go back to the, the richness we've had. And Sadna uh, good, right, gourd. They didn't have, um, they didn't have um, zucchini at the period because zucchini was still in America and America was not, uh, they nobody knew about America then. But they did have something similar to that, which is a gourd. It can be very bitter, but if you get the nice inside, it's very tasty. And around Konya, they still cook that with meat. Gourd is that um, zucchini-like or pumpkin-like thing, which has a long end. It can be very long, growing like that, or it can have a little, you know, head and a little long uh, handle-like thing, which they turn into lambs. Um, garlic they had, uh, sarmachuk, a kind of vermicelli, sikman, time for to, uh, to, time for to press grapes. These are the now they, uh, sages, sages, sage, S-A-C, uh, with no tail, sage, more delicate, uh, is what they make the, uh, the yufka breads, which you will, you can have a taste now. They, they taste wonderful and they sell them in markets nowadays. So how you can see how the rope has come till here. Um, nomadic people, of course, uh, as most people think, they didn't eat a lot of meat, except maybe for the brain that they had to slaughter for the hans, uh, because they needed the sheep, they needed the animals for their, um, for the milk they, they had from. 
from them and they would make cheese and yogurt uh, and uh, they would dry the yogurt again because they didn't have much to eat in the periods when they didn't have any milk from the cows. And this is one, uh, this is near Ula Mula. I just like this picture because they're all sheep here and they sell it. I don't know if you've traveled that far, you will see them all over. Uh, it's the love of the people still for the sheep that they have been, they have been grazing. Um, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, they were uh, imposing their culture on, not by force, but by the, uh, by the population that uh, they had all around uh, the Central Asian geography. And Babur Han is um, a very important Turkish Chatay Han, um, also Mughal, by father Mughal, by mother Turkish, and but they can, he considered himself more Turkish because he spoke Turkish, and he wrote his um, uh, chronicle, it's the Chronicle Babur Name. Uh, it's about how he went to India and what he saw on the way and all that. But uh, he also gives quite a bit of information about the food uh, of his time. And uh, it's hard to believe, but they were making uh, uh, almond marzipan. And not only making it, but filling the apricots of Margilan. It's a, a, it's a city, not anymore there, but I'm not as much as it was. And not only making it, but also filling the apricots with it. I think that's quite uh, going on the way to high gastronomy. And he mentioned the, the beautiful, delicious uh, melons of Fergana, the value between the Amudaria and Sividaria. And they had so much of it that by autumn, when um, the melons had become juicy and sweet, um, people didn't have to buy them. They, are, they were allowed to go into the gardens, uh, the huge gardens they were grown, and they could take them. It was like a holiday for them. Uh, and he mentions this in his Babu Um Now we're slowly coming to uh, their traveling with their horses, galloping with their pots and pans also. <laughs> we have all these pots. I don't know if these are the pots they used then, but um, these are the pots that we used during the period of Ottoman and later on, and I still use them. Um, the history would say, in short words, that the Turks came to uh, Turkey, the, what we call now uh, the Turkey uh, Peninsula, Turkish Peninsula. Uh, by, with Seljuks, another another August uh, Turkish uh, empire, but actually the Turks came to Turkey long before that. The uh, because they were good warriors, uh, the Arabs um, the Arabs would take them and pay them to fight for them. So there were already lots of Turkish people in uh, Anatolia uh, in Turkey. Uh, even before the Seljuk Empire in the 11th century came here. And of course, I'm sure you have heard of uh, Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi, the, uh, the, uh, the head of the, the sect which was um, established by uh, what we call Sufi, the Sufi leader. Uh, he was born in Belk, where Af in Afghanistan, but then he moved down to Konya. Uh, everybody says, the Iranians think, like to think that he is Persian. <laughs> of course, we say he's Turkish because he lived in Konya. Uh, the only thing he wrote in, um, he wrote in uh, Persian, uh, because at the time, the local, the language of the day, the daily language was Turkish. The office language, uh, are those people who worked, they would speak Arabic, but literature and, uh, art, they used uh, Persian. So writing in Persian was uh, high literature. Um, so his, his 
he has uh, volumes of uh, verses, and in his verses we see that uh, the delicate cuisine is slowly uh, is coming uh, and being more and more and more delicate. Um, and also his verses give us uh, give us an idea about what people were eating at that time. That's 13th century. In Mevlana's verses, this is my translation, so if it doesn't make any sense, please excuse. A more beautiful aroma than of Kaya and Borani comes to my nostrils. So, Kaya and Borani is, are two dishes that we still eat. Kaya is a dish, in today's sense, uh, vegetables or the meat cut up uh, in not too small pieces and either cooked uh, and usually cooked by uh, vegetables uh, but at this period uh, from other verses we understand that they were uh, making uh, from liver and borani is a dish um, which was which might have been inspired by the by the persian cooking also now that uh, we have mentioned it People think uh, we have taken a lot from the Arabs, taken not so much from the Arabs, but a lot from Persians, of course. It was giving and taking, uh, but giving and taking, but Turks, Turks practically distilled all the taste, all the dishes that they have come across. There is no dish which is brought up as it is to our, to our gastronomy. What Arabs were doing, especially at the time of the caliphs, uh, it was they were very rich and they could reach to far, uh, far-reaching countries for very special uh, ingredients, and they liked to use it because uh, it gave them a sense of elegance, uh, probably, and knowing more and you know being more in the upper classes. But again, it's the uh, court of the caliphs. Uh, as I have gone through a lot of recipes, I see that they've been adding a lot of things. They cooked meat with chicken, and then they add rose water, then uh, mustard, then uh, I don't know. It's a lot of addition to one dish. So it's a, it's a very complex cuisine, Arab cuisine. But it would be very difficult to cook it, and it would be very difficult to understand the way I think to to understand what you're really eating. Whereas Turks are very straightforward in their approach. If it's meat, they want to eat the meat, the best meat, because why do you change the best meat? It's something or any other ingredient. If it's the best, then you have to have it as it is. Of course, you have to cook it with something to be able to consume. Then, um, the beauty of the worries are more than the Bulgarian concubines. And the wine of the soul is tastier than bulgur rice. So we know bulgur. Bulgur is, a, um, is made from uh, durum wheat or hard wheat. So uh, in the Asian time, they, didn't have, they couldn't have hard wheat. The geography didn't permit it. But here, because of arid soil, uh, the wheat, you can uh, grow good durum wheat. It's one of the countries, Turkey, which brings, which grows good durum wheat. So, uh, they make their bulgur. Anybody who doesn't know what bulgur is? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's wheat which is boiled. Uh, it's a pre-cooked wheat, let's put it, and then cracked to be consumed. They, it continues, deck the pencils of cane Pencils of cane with kebabs. So already, 13th century, again kebabs. The Turkoman gives him it the stock of the tutmaj, and that is plenty for him to be his guardian. Tutmaj is a very important dish, and even in uh, uh, Mahmud al Kashgar writes about it. Uh, it's a dish made of. Um, uh, dough spread out and a lot of additions to it but mostly yogurt and it kept you 
in good condition, gave you, uh, gave you extra energy, and kept your tummy satisfied. So this is one picture of how bulgur is made. This is wheat already cooked and just taken out of the pot uh, to be dried. Um, now, of course, coming to new geographies, you meet, there are new, uh, new things you will meet, not only culturally, but uh, uh, flora-wise, there's a lot of new things you meet. And uh, of course, then you, you can keep it away or you can add it to your gastronomy. This is uh, what the Turkish people did. Whatever they found around themselves, in wherever uh, part of Turkey they settled, they made use of all the uh, new growth ingredients while, or if they grew themselves, if they could grow themselves, uh, they made use of it. Um, and of course, they still kept eating meat. Wheat and its products, of course, now they grew, the gastronomy grew. Uh, they had now more um, delicate breads, sweet breads, uh, sour, uh, salted breads. Uh, and they used a lot of wild greens, and they still had uh, drinks like Buxum and like Ugut, the beer. Ugut was a, a, a, a piece of dough that they put and they fermented and they um, added some things to make a drink, an alcoholic drink. Of course, I forgot to mention the kumis, the kimis. Uh, probably you've heard of the kimis. It's the, the horse uh, milk which is fermented and turned into an alcoholic drink. Uh, and it is said that uh, kimis makes, doesn't make you drunk, it makes you happy, strong, uh, gives you a good feeling. So still now they have, at this season especially, maybe a week before, they have kimis holidays, kimis festivities in uh, Fergana Valley, what I showed you, around Siridaria, the Kyrgyzs, Turkom, Turkmans and Uzbeks. I really wish I could taste a bit of kimis, and I know somebody's making it, I might just. So I just took uh, some pictures, uh, I mean, I put them here, it's from the internet, I didn't take them. Um, what they used, what they started using, you know, um, the, the wild fennel. Wild fennel, they used it with meat, in their pickles, regionally, but a lot of things also went to the palace. Most of the dishes went to the palace. Um, and this is nettle. They used a lot of nettle, which bites you on your hands. And uh, this is the goose foot. Goose foot, uh, it has a special season like April, and they put it in uh, bereks, all that. And this is uh, borage, what they call the tongue of the cow because it so much looks like um, the, the, the tongue, the flowers, and they made, they made um, uh, jams from the... Uh, you have seen the jam of the, the rose that I was making, so they used flowers to make even, not only fruits, but flowers to make jams. So Turkey is also a heaven up because of its floral richness, uh, a place where you can uh, have a lot of uh, greens in your gastronomy, and this is only the four. Probably we have we have a lot more. I was in the um, Baksa, the museum of Baksa, Bayburt, far and um, eastern Turkey, and um, I had a lot beautiful charish, uh, chavish, you know, beautiful things that I have never had before. I was really happy to have seen that. Well. This is the um, uh, the heading, the title of my book, uh, From Tents to Palace, so I put this title up here. I think it makes a lot of sense because regional things have been carried to the, um, to the palace and palace then on gave them back in a better, uh, done in a better way, in a more sophisticated way. Um, Turks aim was to have an empire and uh, the dream was 
accomplished by the 23-year-old Sultan Fatih, quite young, I must say. And uh, he was a very, uh, he set up a lot of rules, a lot of uh, regulations, because already he had in his mind to, to make this a big empire. And then he needed order, regulations, and follow-up, backup. And the first thing, one of the first things he did was to uh, to put the chick, uh, chick kitchen into order, the palace kitchens into order. And of course, cleanliness was very important. Uh, Islamic religion, you know, in Islamic religion, cleanliness is uh, uh, one of the things almost a religious. It has a religious approach. Like you can't, you can't. Uh, if a dog touches a, a plate, you have to wash it at least three times and uh, also again with salt so that it has a special meaning. It's not, it becomes uh, nekruh. Uh, I can't find the word, but it, it's not allowed. You're not allowed to eat it. And we will see how uh, eventually the kitchen became uh, more, had more additions and it, it had all sections. They made breads, red people, halva people, and everybody was specialized in their own section. Uh, it was becoming more challenging each time the, uh, the empire grew, and of course it was becoming more crowded too. At the time of fighting, they had about 100 people working in the kitchen, but by the time uh, the lawmaker, Suleiman, which was the peak of the empire, there were 1,300 people already working in the kitchen, 400 people working in the halvahane. So it was a huge institution, almost a factory. And of course, cooking for sometimes for 50 some people, the initial crowd and everything, they have to have big, um, <laughs> things, you know, big spoons and everything like that. And there's even a true story that uh, when they were, uh, when they were uh, in war, in the northern part uh, where Romania is now, that uh, the Turkish soldiers, the Yenicheris, were attacked uh, suddenly and the group of, uh, group of uh, people who worked in the kitchen, the chefs, archers, they took their pots and pans and <coughs> they, uh, they were very good at it. This is a true story. And uh, I'm not going into detail, but Ahi organization and Sufi orders. Since cleanliness and patience is very important in the kitchen, uh, the Sufi, uh, like Mevlana and other Tibet Hashis, they train the people in the kitchens of their um, orders. Uh, there they learn to uh, have patience and uh, also learn how to cook well. And there's a saying in Turkey, you have to cook with the food uh, so that there's something eatable out of it. And it was so important that the Sufi orders and Bektashi orders, I organizations like social Social uh, social network of the uh, Turks. People just went there and they became. They want to help each other. Whoever came visiting or passing by, Ali organizations would take care of them. It wasn't anything religious. It wasn't just uh, some helpful organization. And ocak, which means hearth uh, and drinking from the soup, çorbacı. So the army of the Ottomans were named such that it, it was taken taken from gastronomical terms. Ocak is the heart where the food is cooked and Yeniseri Ocak. That's very important, the heart of it. Which I mean heart, not heart. Chorbaj is the soup maker. He was an important uh, man in the uh, Yeniseri organization, a warrior, but had good symbols, and he was an important. And of course, as simple as it is, this is the this is the dish the emperor um, the, the sultans wanted to taste as the first dish 
when they fasted during the during the Ramadan period, and if they liked the eggs with onions served to them, the kilaji basha, the head of the pantry who, who offered the sultan the food, is he was to take the plate and bring it to the sultan, open the top, uh, the, the lid, and offer it to him. If he liked it, the kilaji basha would be promoted. So this dish. I made, this was made at home, it turned out pretty good. I'm sure if they could have tasted it, <laughs> I would have been a killer to you speak over Sorry? Uh, you see how delicately it's made. This is a recipe I found out from old times. You, this should not be cooked, but the white has to be cooked. And these should be caramelized, you know, almost caramelized, still trans transparent. It's simple, but if you don't make it right, you better not make it at all, or you know, you'll never become a large question. <laughs> so to to keep the uh, balance of uh, cooking, you have to pour hot water at some parts, and this prevents the dish from or the eggs from burning. So this is how much attendance a simple dish like this uh, wanted or needed. So you can imagine what they did for the others. Uh, but these are what we have, and this was being cooked in 15th century when the conqueror, Yanni with me. Yanni is probably a, a style we took from Iranian cuisine, I like to say. We have to say something. So, <laughs> pekmas. Pekmas uh, is, uh, uh, is the boiled down juice of the grapes by addition after adding a certain soil which comes out in certain parts and it has a chemical um, difference to other soils, it's not really soil, it's a chemical thing which helps the make bad mass. Erishte, you will see now, Erishte is the vermicelli, you know, like the or whatever it is. Of course, we didn't we didn't become as creative as the Italians, making all kinds of capellettis and tortillos, tortinos, you know. But we're, we're still quite creative, and you will see that more down to earth. We soup, uh, we still have it's delicious. Head and trotters, burek, oven burek. Burek is really wonderful. Uh, uh, what, uh, I'm saying wonderful because we have so much of this. It's so um, pleasing, satisfying. You know, you just take one burek and a little iron or a glass of wine, whatever you wish to. Uh, it's finished. I mean, it's a whole meal. It can be a whole meal. Boza, if you haven't had boza, boza is a wonderful drink. Everybody loves it. I mean, those foreigners that I take. It's in Befa, made from wheat or millet. Millet. Baklava, they had, I don't know how fine it was, but they had iron. Uh, dane. Dane is the term used for rice pilaf. Pickled egg plants, we still have them. And pide, pide, you know, the, the like a uh, Venedic gondo, gondo from Venice, but it had um, spinach in it, kadari of sherbet from grapes or sour fruits, halwa with saffron for the sultan and his maids only, pickled onion, kadari with milk, and tutmanch. Tutmanch is the most Ancient dish. Now this is, uh, we started uh, with the first homes of Turks, now we should hopefully see another map of the last homes of the Turks, <laughs> hope it is going in further. <laughs> so, um, you can read this, this was from Goda. So many Turkish states, different states uh, were, were involved in in the, uh, in the empire, so the cultures, of course, they were mixed, a lot was given, perhaps some was taken, and uh, it's inevitable that you have um, an interaction with each other, it's just inevitable. Even with your neighbor, when she cooks something better, you go and ask for the recipe, so this is probably how it happened. And uh, so, as I travel around, I see um, 
lot of imprints of the gastronomy. Uh, and perhaps they have taken what, uh, not perhaps, I'm sure they took something and they added something and it has become a melting pot as they like to call Turkey. This is uh, a sarma I had in Macedonia, Macedonia. Uh, I have better pictures, but since it's uh, from where I found it, I wanted to include it. And these are two beautiful ladies from Albania. Albania uh, is a little town called Peti. It's written with a Q, Peti. Because I kept asking, where is Peking? They said it's in China. <laughs> Peking. I didn't know Q was written as G, you know. So anyway, finally yeah, I found this place and all these ladies, at least 20 of them, had prepared food for us for, um, for a special thing, uh, project we had having. And this is the süt börek. Süt börek, uh, I find in old recipes and I, I'm trying to uh, figure out how it was made. You have the recipes, but uh, if you haven't tasted it, it's difficult to uh, <coughs> make it again, you know, so you have to have a, a taste of it. Of course, this was simply just rice and chicken or meat, and it, they said it's a very important dish, which of course is an important dish in our culture. It's not a fancy dish, but it's filling, and if you have, it needs to be made from the best of rice, best of uh, the meat, then it becomes very satisfying. Um, of course, rice is one of the ingredients that uh, the Ottomans have spread around the area. Um, even though uh, the Persians cook a beautiful um, rice pilaf uh, with a kate underneath, still the style we make it is also very tasty. <laughs> My, my children love it. Anyway, I think rice has gone as far as Venice, where the risotto is very popular, where the risotto has evolved. And uh, they call in Venice the uh, risotto Turkish rice. They don't call it the risotto. And at that period, uh, 16th century, they had special, uh, special serving dishes with the domed shapes like in Turkey to offer this um, uh, this rice dishes. And this is one picture I had from uh, Greece, Komotini. Uh, it's very close to Turkey, so no wonder we have all these sweets which you find in Turkey. And there's a, a big Turkish population there. So, But this kind of thing is made everywhere in Greece. I mean, um, Greeks or Turks, whatever, live there, they make these, um, uh, some of them are very Turkish, like this Lumba Tatlısı, and of course, this is from the Bakla, but it's not so clear. Anyway, this is to see. I don't know how much time has gone. Hmm? I think it's um, quite a time that we spend. Um, you know all these things, don't you? I'm trying to <laughs> see some pictures. Uh, that was without any effort. You know, a meze table. Eventually, we stopped eating one dish. Even the sultan ate one dish at a time, you know, because he enjoyed the best and just one dish that was good. But eventually, we took some habits from the, uh, the people who drink like the Greeks and the Jewish people, so we are preparing meze tables and there's such a big variety that it's balanced and tasty and of course grains are turned into beautiful uh, chorex, civets and that's a bulgur pilaf with lots of onions and uh, purple basilic that I devised. You can play around with bulgur, you can do anything with it, you know, you, it tastes anything. I cooked one time uh, for Italians uh, in, um, in Roma and there was a Italian chef, important Italian chef. I made a bulgur salad right there. It has to be the fresher, the better. He said, "What's that?" Oh, he said he took it and uh, we were both preparing our dishes for the uh, guests. He 
added sugar to it and served it that. <laughs> so you can make a dessert if you like. <laughs> anyway, vegetables, we have, it's a heaven of vegetables, Turkey. You can use uh, any kind of vegetable. The style is always uh, quite similar. You know, you can make it with ground meat, with a cubed meat, and added tomatoes. Tomatoes did a lot of, uh, um, was good for us because it brings tang to the food. And tang, uh, the, the Turks like the tang. They like tangy food, like yogurt has always tang. Not the yogurts you find now, but the, the yogurts at the time because they kept it for a long. So tomato has the, the necessary tang, tanginess, if that's the word, the, the, the sourness. Not so sour, but you know, quite. Of course, uh, they cooked, uh, these tomato dishes were cooked after the uh, 18th century. Until uh, tomatoes became popular, they didn't. So fish from four seas, now we have seen the, the, the sea fish, so you can um, eat a lot of fish in Turkey, but they always ask for fish recipes. Turkish cuisine is a pure cuisine. It's a very sophisticated. Sophisticated in the sense that it has to be cooked right. You can add so many things to anything, but if it's not, if, if the meat is cooked too much, like a stove, why do you, what do you do with the spices or anything which has been added to it? The main uh, ingredient has to cook in the best way possible. And uh, complexity should come uh, not from lots of spices, but from the techniques. If you cook something slowly, it acquires better taste. You know, it absorbs the oil, the, the oil absorbs the taste of the vegetable. So, uh, a good uh, palate can uh, taste or can tell the difference between a nicely cooked dish or not so nicely cooked dish. This is um, uh, a dried fish, which I really love. Uh, I forgot the name, Nani. Chiros. Chiros. Chiros. Uh, that you keep in vinegar uh, for a while to soften it up, but then first you grill it and um, with the rock cakes. <laughs> and sweets, of course, in Turkey is um, uh, a heavy again for sweets. This is a remani, I added some apricots to it, and I'm going to add something else to it in my next book because I saw something delicious in Üsküp, Skopje. In um, Macedonia, right? A delicious thing, so my revival will be another thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, toasting to your honor, um, Sherefe. Um, Raki is a national drink, as much as Arman says it's not. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we totally support the Raki, of course. Mm -hmm. and the visit table as we have already gone over. And we have, of course, celebrative food like the, the, the little cakes or little kravies, paklavas, um, and dishes especially for feast of sacrifice. And we have ashure for to come up with those art. My ashure is beautiful. Right? Right. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so. We have beautiful markets where you can go and uh, pick whatever you want. And this lady, I love this photo because this lady has grown everything in her garden. You can imagine, and she has brought everything to sell here. Beautiful. And the street food of Istanbul is just, um, people find it very exciting. And you really can feed, feed yourself, you know, very, nicely on any kind of street food here in Turkey. And, um, well, again, bureks, bureks, a lot. This uh, my bureks, by the way, you know. Um, it looks good, yeah. <laughs> it tastes not good, too. And uh, more street food, cucumbers, cooker came later, nuts, and so on and so forth. Food of the adventurous, uh, cockroach, I love. And uh, we have also a dolma where cockroach is filled. My grandmother used to make it. It is so tasty. And then it's fried. Everything is, you know, 
So all these unusual things. And so with my hoshops, I thank you for coming.